Behind me is the world that we live. And this is a world that's becoming ever more connected as time goes on. And this world that we live in has more technologies than we ever have before, and we can learn more about where we live than we ever have at any time in our history. But in order to really understand our world, we have to understand our geography. We have to understand our geographies of where it is that we are and how everything interrelates. And one of the problems that we see is that people don't necessarily understand geography, what geography is. Because geography is more than trying to find a location on a map. Geography is understanding everything and how it's connected. And even with this marginalization of geography, seeing it as just, where's something on the map? How do I get from A to B? We do poorly in our geography. There was a study that was done in 2014 by the Washington Post. And they asked people to find Ukraine on a map. And one out of six Americans could do it. One out of six. And so that was interesting in and of itself, that we don't know where Ukraine is. But what was more interesting is that they found a trend. The farther the guess was, farther the correct guess was from the location that they were asked to find, the more likely it was that they supported military intervention. So what does this tell us? It tells us that our attitudes and behaviors are linked in a lot of ways to what our knowledge is of geography, of what we know and what we don't know. One of the things as a geography pr professor is that I try to make people geographically literate. <laughs> I try to make them understand more than just the marginalization of geography, more than just understanding where is a location in the world. I try to get them to understand that it is understanding the relationship between physical systems and human systems. It's the understanding of how forces, processes, and events uh, influence societies and influence our environments. It's understanding a location, but then how it's connected to everywhere else, at local scales, all the way to the global scale. And that's what I want to do, is I want people to be able to speak spatially. And I want them to be able to do it in a way that has meaning to them. So maybe instead of just knowing where things are, it's, it's for us to start identifying and to recognizing the where of things. So if you take things that have meaning to you, maybe if you understand the underlying geography behind them, it'll bring you closer to being a connected society. And so whether it be something mundane or something innovative, whether it be taboo or not, whether it be an ordinary thing or extraordinary, I think we can find the geography in everyday things and find the where of them. Now, this might not have value to you, <laughs> drinks per se, but I am a geography professor teaching at a university. So most of my students find some sort of value in it, <laughs> whether or not that's good. And so I can use these things to find that ge geographical context. Where is the origin of these ingredients? Why do we find grapes in certain climates? What is the traditions and the underlying um, cultural value of a certain drink in a certain location. Because we live in an amazing world, and I want you guys to realize it is amazing, and I want you to see things and to see how they're more relevant, and to see how they're more, I want it, things to be more accessible, more relevant, and more important, everyday things more important, so that we see this amazing world, and we just don't see where we live. We see the bigger picture. So I'm going to start with beer. Beer is the third most popular drink in the world after water and tea. And even though you can make this at home or it can be made in a large brewery, it does have a spatial quality to it. And it's really remarkable how you can take four ingredients, just four ingredients, and that being water, a cereal grain like barley, hops, and hops is what gives it its aroma and flavor. 
And then finally, yeast, which is the workhorse of making beer. It's what gives it the alcohol content and the carbonation. How we can take these four simple things and be able to make hundreds of different styles and varieties of beer. Now, some beers that we know of have an inherent geography to them. English porters, Belgium ales. So these have that naming nomenclature to them. But what do we say of all the other ones that don't necessar aren't necessarily named after a certain place? What do we do with those? So a colleague of mine, Mark Patterson, and now an alumni, Rebecca Matter, decided to look at the origin of traditional and craft styles um, of beer. And we were able to see that, indeed, there is a geography to them. But then once we see the global look of it, we can take it down and look at the nuances. What is an English porter? Why is IPAs, India Pale Ales, why are they found in certain locations? And I'll just give you an, an example where it could be what's in your water. If I was in Burton-on-Trent, which is located in England, this is where the origins of IPA come from. And the reason that IPAs are so good from that, that location is because of the water quality. In the water, there's lots of calcium, lots of sulfates, and that minerality gives, gives the taste that, that fresh, uh, tart, hoppy finish, very dry finish, with the lingering taste afterwards that we all know of with that hop. Now, if I compare that to another region, say the Czech Republic, where pilsners originate, you'll find that the water quality is completely different. In fact, it's probably the closest thing to distilled water. And that's what gives those lagers, that pilsners that are there, that very clean, smooth, fresh taste. And so something like water can be that thing that makes a difference between two locations, or what gives it that, that oomph, or what makes it good. Now, if I even take it down to a smaller scale, we can think about the fact that we've got beers made from all over the world, with or origins from all over the world, but they're being made everywhere now. So how do we still make it geographic? And we can do that by using neolocalism. It's giving a sense of place and identity um, by using imagery or words. And so, for example, if I use a local example here in Kennesaw, if I go down the road a little ways, there's a road called Burnt Hickory. And Burnt Hickory goes through a national battlefield. And that battlefield is at Kennesaw Mountain. And in 1864, there was a Civil War battle there where the Confederate soldiers dragged cannons up the side of little Kennesaw Mountain so that they could repel the Union forces. And we can see that history and that geography in beer labels like the one behind me. Now, I can look at history in terms of neolocalism, or I can look at it in terms of mapping it. And so the next series of maps I'm going to show you is by Sam Batsley from the University of uh, Wisconsin-Madison. And I'm just going to go quickly through geography, through our history, by looking at where breweries are. So here we go. We started out about 1612. We got some beers going on. That's great. OK, it starts to migrate, and you can see where you have the colonials. It's still a northy thing, not really a southy thing, but that's OK. As you keep going on to the, up into the 1840s, you see that you've got the Germans that are coming over. So we're not just drinking ales anymore. We're now drinking lager drinks. Yay, German immigrants. We can see that they're all through the Midwest, but they're starting to move out west as well. Going west, yay ho. OK, keep going on. We're past the Civil War. It has a plethora. Boom, everybody's wanting beer. Everyone's making beer. But it's still more of a northwest thing, not north west, but north and west thing. The south hasn't gotten quite into it yet. Don't worry, they will. But 1920 comes along. We've got this certain thing that happens called prohibition. Boom. Oh, it's the sad time in American beer history. <laughs> but that's OK. It only lasts for a few years. In 1932, the amendment was repealed. We can drink beer again, and it goes really well. At this time, it's basically the big companies that are doing it. They're starting to consolidate. We have our big brands that we know of. Um, taste of the Rockies, all this type of stuff. And then what we have in the late 80s is we've got rules and regulations that basically allow people to have microbreweries and brew pubs and woohoo. We have more beers and more craft breweries and brew pubs and all these places that we can get 
alcohol, beer specifically, than any other time in the history. And there's over 4,000 now. Okay, that's great. But what are we doing now? Well, one of the ways we could do that is we could look at Twitter's, Twitter data. So we can look at our tweets. And some tweets are geocoded, which means that there is this metadata behind it that says, oh, I tweeted it here. Just FYI to anyone who tweets. <laughs> um, and so Matt Zook and Ate Porthus uh, from the University of Kentucky decided to map tweets. So they first looked at some regional breweries, and we can see that we drink uh, where the breweries are mainly located, whether it be the Grain Belt in Minnesota or Sam Adams out in the New England area or Yingling down in Florida. Wait, Yingling in Florida? I thought that was from Pennsylvania. Ah, but they, they did. They opened a new brewery. Or even Corona um, out in the San Diego region. We see that there's regionalism. And you say, well, that's great, Nancy. What about the national brands? Well, four out of the six national brands are light beers, so we'll go with those. They're the most popular by volume. And even those, we find a regionalism to them. And we can see here in the South, we'll probably be more likely talking about Bud Light. If you're in Idaho, you'd be talking about Bush. And out West, you'd be talking about Coors Light. There's still, still geography to what we drink, even with the big brands. Now, I know not everybody likes to drink beer. That's OK. Uh, it is. <laughs> and so we can still see trends. So if we look at tweets and we use the keywords beer and wine, we can see that wine is, is mainly drunk in places where they grow it and in places with high population densities, Atlanta being one of them, Phoenix, and even into the New York area. We see these trends of what we drink. And of course, beers drinking in the Midwest where there's that legacy of beer uh, from those German immigrants. So I'm now going to move on to wine. And if anything, if any of these types, beer, wine, and liquor, has a geography to it, it's going to be wine. And there's a, a term we use called terroir. Terroir. Say it with me. Terroir. terroir. Oh, that's beautiful. OK, the terroir basically says there's a sense of taste, a sense of place in what you taste. OK, isn't that beautiful? It's um, so if you can imagine, you have your wine, you switch it up, mm, it smells like France, right? And I'm going to use that as an example. And wherever our grapes are grown, they're going to be tasting different. So I'm going to use an example of a, a grape variety known as Sauvignon Blanc. Maybe you guys have had it, maybe not. This is grown in all regions that you find grapes. But what makes it unique in the Loire Valley of France is that, yes, it's this beautiful wine, it has this crisp, tart taste, it has a taste of gooseberries, it also has this beautiful taste sometimes of, of green peppers and some other interesting things and what the French like to call pipi de chat. Yes, it actually has in this beautiful estate, in these beautiful places, just, just imagine yourself there, this flavoring. <laughs> pipi de chat, cat pee. It is an aroma that you find in this area in New Zealand, but if you got a Sauvignon Blanc from California, you will not taste that. And that is an example of terroir. Now, if I move on to spirits, and we can use something as simple as whiskey. If you have a whiskey from America or from Ireland, you put an E in it. Everywhere else, you don't. So it can be as simple as how we spell it, but it can also be a global mixology, and cocktails are a great example of that. So I'm going to use a certain cocktail, but I'm going to give you a little geography quiz here. Where's this? New York. New York, specifically? Yay, Manhattan. OK, so we have Manhattan. This is Manhattan. We also have a drink called Manhattan. I'm not going to get into the history. It's very interesting. One of the stories has to do with Winston Churchill's mother, but besides that. There are four main ingredients that go into a Manhattan. So not only does a Manhattan have a sense of place in terms of its name, the Manhattan, but it also has a global mixology to it. So if you look at a map, in order to make a good, a good Manhattan, you have to have your American rye whiskey, which would be from America. You then have a sweet vermouth that comes from Italy. Next are some bitters that come originally from Venezuela, but are now found in Trinidad and Tobago. 
And then finally, we've got our maraschino cherries, not the ones that you normally see, true maraschino cherries from Croatia, but I give the Italians a little bit of credit too because um, they love their maraschinos. So we can see if we look at this, there is a globalness to this drink that we may only just associate with our borough in New York City. Another thing to keep in mind is that though this is a Manhattan, if I decided instead of using rye whiskey and I wanted to use scotch whiskey, it'd be called a Rob Roy. So names can be a lot and what we use can be a lot as well. So I'm going to end you with a story about the Pisco Sour. I'm sitting in a bar. It's not one of those stories. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting in a bar, and to the left of me is a Chilean, and to the right of me is a Peruvian. And in front of me is a Pisco Sour. And for the next three hours, I get to hear about the history and geography of Peru and Chile. And it all culminates with this drink because the Pisco Sour is the national drink of both Chile and Peru. And so they're telling me which one really, really is the true Pisco Sour. What I want you to do next time you have a drink, and if you're not legal, get a glass of milk. But I want you to think about what it is that you're drinking. Think of not only the where of it, but I want you to think about how it relates to more than just where you live. Because we live in this amazing place, and I think it's really important that we're able to understand our geographies, whether or not it's a drink or something else. So take yourself a drink and discover the world with it.